Francois, how are you, my friend? Hey, you look great. Thank you, both. <laughs> wait, wait, let me go full screen. Here we are. I'm good. Hey, look, uh, if I move, look, if I move here, you see? <laughs> That's great. I love it. Uh, it's also very coy because one of the ears is down. I, I dig that, dude. Yeah. How have you been? been? I've been well. I've been in Singapore, you know, so we have another month of lockdown, but uh, I've been well. Yeah. I saw, and, and so you eat your shoes behind? That's what you have to eat all day? Your shoes right. behind you? Well, well, I'm not going to be walking anywhere in them, so, you know. Okay. <laughs> it's a, yeah, it, it reminds me that I actually have a, a couple of pairs of decent shoes, you know? Okay. Okay. So, Fr uh, Francois and Reba Anamis, thank you so much for joining me, sir. Uh, one of the guys I respect most, one of the most dynamic uh, leaders in the watch industry. And um, so I wanted to talk about leadership because you admire a guy that I also like a lot. And I'm going to give, give you a couple of quotes from him, and, and I think then you'll know who he is. Uh, the greatest teacher of failure is, and the name must be your fear before banish it you can. Um, Wait, 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 sorry, but I don't hear you that well. Do that again, please, because uh, the, the, the sound is not that good. Go ahead again. Okay, so there's a, a, a leader, like a world leader that I, I really respect and love, and I know you do as well. And I'm going to give you two of his, his, his most famous quotes, but you have a third one that I know you use a lot. Uh, so the first one is, the greatest teacher failure is, and the second one is, name must be your fear before banish it you can, right? Okay. And I so think do you need me to tell you who is, who is the leader? <laughs> yeah, For real? I think you know who it is. Um, yeah, absolutely, I know. He looks green, no? He looks very green, and he's, uh, he's Yoda, and he's probably yes. the guy that in some ways we need to learn from the most and during this period. What do you mm -hmm. think? Uh, hopefully not only him. <laughs> <laughs> but that could be a start. That could yes. be a start, yes. Um, his has always been a message of benevolence and uniting people. And I think that one of the things I guess we've all taken away, and I think one of the things you see in the AP family, you know, is that it's a global family. It's a family that's about unity, whether it's uh, Horror Loop, our buddy in Shanghai, whether it's people here in Singapore, whether it's your, your guys in America, it's, it's, a, it's a global family. And I think we're all very united. And it, I think at times like this, it's particularly cool to speak to someone like yourself, who is, you know, the guy, the man behind the brand, sir. No, but uh, we always say that Odom oh, is a brand about people. It's about people's talents, failure, joy, sadness, everything. And at the end, it makes a big family. I wouldn't say I would call this a modern family because we're not always perfect, okay, at everything we do, but it's a brand about people. That's what matters the most. And when the crisis started, and I spoke to Jasmine Onmar and say, okay, so uh, do, do we agree on the same base, the fact that one, nobody's gonna go, no matter what, and uh, we have to protect the integrity, the health integrity of our people. That was done. We didn't speak about money. We didn't speak about savings. We didn't speak about uh, minimum margin that should deliver no matter what. It was all about people. And I do think that people know that, love that, respect that, and that's why we get the best out of them. That's incredible, dude. I mean, you know, I look back at, and, uh, at, at your leadership since 2012, which is also incidentally the year of the launch of the 15202, which I know you were kind of behind because you were on the board of directors even before this. Um, and I look back at this, what you've achieved in this time. You've more than doubled the revenues. You went from, you know, the production of, I guess in 2000, it was around 16,000 pieces. I guess by 2012, must have been closer to 20. But today, I think last year you did 40,000 pieces, but there's not enough watches in the world, right? Um, how right. do you they might be now? Now they might be. <laughs> well, I, I don't know because I think um, everyone has checked to see if they they can get onto the list of the fifteen two hundred two, or they can get onto the list of the ultra thin perpetual calendar, or the mm -hmm. or the ceramic perpetual calendar. <laughs> no one still can. What mm -hmm. must be the temptation? Because you know you could essentially solve your revenue issue overnight by just making a few more of these. Would that be a temptation, for example? Absolutely not. I don't even think about it a second because it's at the end, it's not about the fact that we want to, it's all about the revenue. It's not about the revenue. And it's not about two or three months or six months or the end of 2020. I don't care. I'm already past 2020. We know we're going to get hurt this year, no doubt. Whether it's going to be 15, 20, 25%, we don't know that yet because. For example, in Singapore, when a few days ago, you just found out that we'll have another month uh, stuck in your homes, 
So that's what it is. And we get those decisions made almost on a daily basis. So we cannot forecast accordingly. What we know is, one, we'll have closed our production facilities for close to two months. And these two months, we won't be able to add them back at the end of the year, like rushing, rushing to get what is out. So we are losing two months of production and we won't recapture them. So here you are, that's a loss of revenue. Does it mean that we look at it, oh, it's gonna be very bad? No, because Automapic has been strong enough over the course of the last years uh, to build uh, enough reserve, first of all, and think to weather the storm in a, in a, in a good way. And if we drop the sales to 30,000 watches, 32,000 watches, 34,000 watches, it's okay. Our goal is to think 2021, 22, 23, but the most important question is not that one. The most important question is, is the world gonna be the exact same one as before? Absolutely. That's the only, and that's basically the only question. And I've heard from people that some of them think that, yes, it's gonna go back as a copy and paste as what it was before. And I know that, uh, when I address the subject and the topic, oh yeah, is watching me, making sure I don't say anything stupid or crazy, <laughs> but, it, but I'm gonna say it. These people need to check the closest and the nearest hospital and they have something wrong in their brain, okay? Because the world will not go back exactly the way it was. And for the better, hopefully. So, are people going to look at spending money a bit differently in the, in the month and years to come? Yes, I do believe they will. And uh, they will be more responsible. You've heard uh, maybe in the last two days some announcement in the fashion world where Giorgio Armani announced that the whole new fashion system with six fashion shows per year and the whole thing was a complete waste. And we should go back to a lot more meaning behind what it means to buy new clothes. Uh, if Saint Laurent announced that they would actually go away from the fashion week, because again, it goes too far, too much money spent for a short time, not really relevant. And I do believe that it does open doors for us to think about what's next. There is a good thing about it. In, in this type of times, this is where you actually get more creative, you get more innovation, get people really truly thinking. When the rest of the year, you are already running like crazy. You don't have the time to reflect. Funny enough, if you look back at the history of watchmaking, not only the Mapier, yeah, watchmaking, people experience confinement. Why? Because it was the winters and they were farmers. They were not watchmakers, they were farmers. And because they got stuck in their homes during harsh winters, they had to make and manufacture small objects to trade for food with Geneva and Lausanne. And eventually, these small objects became watches. And they were creative people, were creative minds, that because of the fact that they were stuck in their homes, were putting out there some true, incredible craftsmanship. So there is something there that could come back as well as the history. And I like this idea a lot. I love that. And I also love the fact that AP or Demar Piguet has always done its best in during a crisis, right? So its most famous achievement re in recent memory, well, one of the most famous achievements in, in watchmaking is the Royal Oak. The Royal Oak comes out in 1972. That's two mm -hmm. years after the launch of the Seiko um, Accutron, where the entire watch industry is decimated. I mean, people are selling mechanical movements by the weight. They're destroying their own mm -hmm. machinery. And instead of doing this, AP comes out with one of the most radically designed watches of all time at a price point that was so crazily divorced from what Seiko was doing. At 3,500 Swiss francs, when you first came out with the Royal Oak in 72, you can buy a Jaguar for this. You know, you can probably buy a Jaguar and it's a bunch of people to hang out with you as you're driving your Jaguar <laughs> around as well. And it was completely the opposite of the mentality of, of what was going on, this panic. Right. So I, I, I imagine that AP's tradition is one in which you do your best work in the middle of crisis. But I agree with you. It's kind of like, how do you respond to this crisis? Well, you were ahead of the curve. You were the one who was already saying seasonality for watches is stupid. Like, I, I don't want to have to feel this, like this, this artificial pressure just to launch new watches for the sake of launching them. There's no point. And I want to be much closer to my client. And I don't want to make this a wholesale event, which SES or Watches of Wonder now was. And you, that's one of the reasons you left. Do these mm -hmm. still... These, these, these were actually really smart ideas, especially in the context of the day, right? 
Okay, so now we'll see what comes next. Thank you, first of all, for the appreciation, but uh, I do believe that um, we got some unbelievable ideas recently about what could come next at Audemars Piguet. And I'm not talking about product, because product and innovation, we are, we are, the good news is we, we have been able to work with all our R&D departments, even from home, for, with the guys from home. So uh, they came out with some incredible ideas about what we could do. So that's one side of the business. But the biggest thing is what message are we going to de deliver to the world, to our clients, for the years to come? And something came up as an idea, uh, which has been looked at by very few people so far. I won't share with you. Don't start. I won't share it with you completely. But people say it's 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 uh, what we call a it's a revolution, it's, uh, not an evolution at all. It it might scare a lot of people, not the clients. I'm talking people within the brand. Let's say too much but it's brilliant so let's see where we go with that okay okay, okay. I, I think i might have remember that on this specific day yes. i told you yes. that something will come with ap that is really really special about what the future of this, the business could be that's amazing um and i like the fact that also your focus is on perenniality, things that endure, that are classics forever, and that you've also, like Giorgio Armani, likewise, all of what you're saying is that these things should last forever and should have permanent relevance. Now, mm -hmm. you've also completely revolutionized, well, you've taken the first big step in, the re in revolutionizing the way in which watches are sold, right? So you're moving away from the traditional retail space and uh, with, your, with your home concept, with your AP houses, which you have now in several cities around the world, including uh, London, Hong Kong, uh, I think there's two in Spain. Uh, Madrid, yeah. Barcelona, Milano, uh, 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 sorry, Frankfurt. Yes. No, Munich, Munich, sorry. No, Munich, Munich. And we got to open, nice. and then we got to open Bangkok. We got to open Tokyo. And eventually one day we got to come to Singapore as well. Nice. And New York City, meatpacking, right? Sure. Sure, Cause big I, one. Because I, uh, I will stay in Soho House, so I'm going to be right next to it, right next door. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, and I love, incidentally, Bravo on the neighborhood, because this is a neighborhood that is vibrant, that's real. Like, I don't know why everyone is kind of like still wanting to be in Fifth Avenue and so on like that. I mean, you know, I, I love the fact that you, you brought it to where actually the cool people are. And I know mm -hmm. that you, the whole generational thing is very important. Um, but I wanted to talk to you about the house, the format of the house, because you were mentioning that um, people have a tendency to dwell two times as long when they go into that context as opposed to a traditional retail environment. They're mm -hmm. made to feel relaxed. They're made to feel as if they're learning. It's a sense of conviviality with friends. We just did an event in London at your house where our friend Mo cooked uh, Italian food, you know, and people loved it. What gave you this idea and, and why and do you think this is permanently the future in terms of uh, watch retail? Because I do believe that retail doesn't work under the format, the, the, the concept of one size fits all. I'm going to give you a perfect example. Uh, let's say you've got three kids, okay? And you have an appointment with me. I'm your sales guy in Singapore, and you have to come to, a, to, to the store. And that morning, you have to stop by at 10 a.m. for 20 minutes because you wanted to see something, but your day starts very badly. You're getting into an argument with your wife. You are the one dropping the kids to school that morning. And the whole thing starts in the worst possible way. So you're going to be late in the store. And when you call me to tell me you're going to be late, if I'm good enough, I'm going to sense that it shouldn't be the right time because your mood is now a mood which I'm going to call A. You're in mood A. That same you, that same you, has a dinner with your wife in the store that evening special event, 10 people, 12 people, we're going to introduce something special. When you show up at the store, it's 6.30, 7 o'clock. Your kids are taken care of by the, house, by, by, the, by the babysitter. You're done. The argument that transforms into, sorry, honey, I love you, everything's cool. You arrive in the store, and that same you now, okay, is in the mood B. The odds are I'm going to have more chances to convince you to do anything than in the morning, the same you. Yes. And when you go to a retail store, 
you, you don't enter a retail store without thinking that eventually you could buy. So there is a sort of pressure, subtle pressure there that you're in to buy. And if the salespeople are not good enough to feel what type of mood you're in, they could actually um, push you away from the brand, which we see nine times out of 10 in any luxury store today, whether it's watches, fashion, name it. The, the experience in stores is not as good as it should be. Okay? So because of that, we have to reinvent the whole concept. And when you go to a house, it's a house. It's not a store anymore. You want to come for a drink? You want to come to have breakfast? You want to come to have a business uh, meeting with your people? You want to come for a baby shower? You want to come for a birthday celebration? We could do so many more things that make you feel that it's not an obligation to buy. And when you don't have any obligation to do anything, guess what? That's what you're going to do. You go, <laughs> you go for <laughs> it because it's a complete fun mindset. Yes. And that, that's what it's all about at the end. You're absolutely right. You know, the thing is, uh, we, well, you sell beautiful objects, the entire industry does, but they are objects. And, and I, I know you have a whole uh, very good treatise on emotion and, and how emotion can be mm -hmm. a song, it can be a piece of art. But a watch is, is a purely an emotional object, right? You know, no one needs a watch. And so I guess the whole idea is to be able to interact with people when they're most emotionally receptive to it, right? And I guess the, the house concept is that first step, right? We're working on a, a little project as well in the Maldives that is also working on emotional receptivity as well, because you're right. The guy in the morning, like maybe later in his villa in the evening, and he, he's smiling, he's in a good mood. I don't know why, but he could be in a very good mood. <laughs> By the way, on your specific idea, if, if this idea took a little from mine, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be okay just making 20, 20 points on you. Huh? It's okay. You, we wire the money where I tell you, but I won't Absolutely. make 20 points. That's minimum. Why, don't, why don't we instead open an AP house out there? We take one villa, we take one villa and we just make it an AP house, just during the peak season, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Think about it. Don't say no now. Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? It, it's, it's, a, it's a fun place. Who knows? So I wanted to talk to you also about generations, right? I, I know that you had, you told this great story about a guy, a guy that messaged you. I don't know if he DM'd you or emailed you. Um, and he was like, hey, Francois, how are you doing? I'm 24 years old and I sold my first company when I was 17. And I've loved AP and the Royal Oak since I was 12. And, you know, I just wanted to say, Good job, you know? And, and clearly the language of people from the generation of today, which we absolutely need, is a more informal language, but it's one in which they feel this incredible, um, I don't know, uh, right to be able to contact you. Now, what was surprising was then you just contacted him back as well and said, I, I think you called him actually, which freaked him out. And, and he was like, oh my God, is it really you? But then you basically won him for life there and probably converted a whole bunch of his friends as well. So mm -hmm. do you feel that this is the, this outreach program, this, this way of talking through social media, through phone calls, through hanging out with these, this, this group of people, is fundamental for the, to engaging the next generation? I go back to what I was talking about at the beginning, people, and whether you're 7, 10, 20, 30, 50, or 70 years old, at the end, you got to deal at some part with your emotions. And I'm not on social media at all, so I don't use this as a tool myself, but I use phone. I use direct connections. And the fact that I've got kids also is helping me a lot because I know what's going on and I see what, what's trending and how they operate with each other. And it's not because you sell expensive items that you have to be stuffy or very almost snobbish, snobbish about what you do. It's an open world. And the best example I have, I was telling this to another person two days ago. There's a French actor, his name is Omar C. Um, and very close to the brand, close, close friend of mine. And he came to, the, to Le Brassu with two of his kids, two boys, seven and 10. And normally we do not take kids because we always have the risk that they're gonna run into a, <laughs> into a workshop and potentially boom, a watchmaker that has worked on something. Not so good, but he's a big movie star in France. So we say, okay, you can come with your kids. And the plan for the day was that he would visit the, 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 the factory in the morning and we'll have lunch together. And in the afternoon, they would go, the kids would actually go to the chocolate factory, okay? Which was cool. And the father would stay with us. 
at lunch, the kids said, we are not going to the chocolate factory. We are staying at Audemars Piguet. And by the end of the day, they told their dad, dad, uh, we have an agreement here. Your watches, they will be our watches, right? Okay, because they, they were also two sisters. They said, no, 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 the watches are for us, right? Okay, the watches come to us <laughs> seven and 10 years old. And if to these kids, I was talking like, so, um, Hi, Jordan. How is everything this morning? What do you think? No, I have to adjust because at the end, selling, promoting is about dancing and you have to adjust all the time. And yes, the language had to be adjusted because if we would still use the language that we used to have 20 years ago for the younger generation, they would fall asleep completely. It would be very, 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 very boring. <laughs> but you know you've always been so receptive to both the younger generation and even to demographics that in some ways were underserved back into 20 years ago when you were in new york for example uh you were talking about in 2001 you were hanging out with jay-z and damon dash and these guys listening to in, in the recording studio listening to the music they were putting together and in some ways that these guys which is incredible if you look at it 20 years from now, you realize that these guys have become the most influential, you know, sort of like uh, um, musical figures of today. I mean, Jay-Z is basically like Elvis, right? You know, mm -hmm. it, it's, uh, but at the time, these guys were interested in watches, but they weren't getting any sort of traction with meeting people who were behind the brand, right? Your, 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 your the message has always been one of including people. And how did you decide that you, you thought these guys are serious, I want to engage with them. And in the end, I think even a couple of years later, you ended up doing a, a limited edition for Jay-Z, though I think at the time when he told you, you thought you were like, well, you know. <laughs> no, but we met the very first time in 2001, and I will always remember because we are blasting his music in our office when he showed up, and he was actually shocked that we could actually play his music in our office. But you have to, you have to all either remember or maybe you don't know. When he showed up the first time in 2001, he had already 14 Audemars Piguet watches, wow. including a triple complication. There was no grand complication then, it was a triple complication. So he was serious about AP. Why? No clue. But that brand spoke to him even before we, we met. And on the first day of the meeting, he said, I want to make a limited edition with you. And I said, hip hop, rap. <laughs> it's gonna be tricky. You have to remember 2001. Uh, really tricky. And I remember the way I sold it to Jean Jean Mélenchon, who was the CEO then, and that eventually sold it to the board. Okay. I came with a picture of Jay Z and Prince Charles that I got from a magazine, and a picture of PDD and William Lauder from Estee Lauder. Right. And they were making the fragrance together. Yes. I said, look, hip hop is exactly what was jazz in the 20s, starting in the African American world and went completely mainstream. This is what hip hop is going to become. It's going to go crazy, worldwide, everyone's going to go, and that music is the next music. I don't know if there is a story behind, but I don't know if you know the story because now I can share it. Uh, when we work on the watches, so my idea to make a limited edition. Uh, so by the way, I got the green light to make a limited edition for the US market in the hundred watches. Right. At that time, it was is the launch of his 10th album. And we wanted to do something crazy where every single watch would be engraved with a gnome, the, the title of one of his songs. Wow. And then in the box with a watch with a parchment, okay, with the music. And the lyrics written with a special pen wow. and signed by him. So every watch would be unique. Except that in too many titles of these songs, there are bad words. <laughs> we cannot engrave <laughs> on our watch. <laughs> and we cannot engrave on the watch. So we say, mm, that's not going to work. So we have to reassess the whole thing. And we launched the watch with iPods with his 10 albums on it. And the watch was a complete success. And that did open. A complete new world of clients, of age group as well. You started to see athletes going after the market. Why? Because they were listening to Jay's music or the others' music before the games. Okay, and the whole thing started to roll. 
in incredible story. And I, I know your relationship with music is one, very passionate as one. 07, you do um, your collaboration with Quincy Jones. Um, you are uh, now a partner at the Montreux Jazz Festival as well. I believe there's also this wonderful um, uh, video of Bruno Mars giving uh, a piece to all of his crew and his family, right? Um, but for you, during this period of self-isolation, what is, what, what is the go-to music that you listen to? Same. I haven't changed much. I still listen to the same thing when I work out. I still have my basic uh, playlist and I blast the music in the... <laughs> what, what's, on the what's on the front? So I, and incidentally, it looks like you've been, it's very effective because you look, you look great. Um, you Thank you. You've been working out a lot. Uh, um, so what is, what is number one on the, on the front of Benamia's workout um, playlist? No, because it, it depends. First of all, I've got seven playlists, right. which are all two hours each. So I've got a lot of different kinds of music, and it's funny because my coach is 26 years old. Oh, he loves. Sorry, but he loves old rock and roll. Okay. Wow. Which I'm not much into, to be honest okay. with you. So when he listens to what I listen, to, say, eh, no good. No, good. he's 26 years old. I say, come on, this is this is this is the real thing. He say, no, it doesn't. So so, so it's. It's, we don't share the same vision of music at all. But I don't care because he's at my house, he's my coach, and I listen to my music. But my music is very eclectic. I could go from uh, 70s and 80s, from uh, Michael Jackson, Earth, Wind and Fire, Wind and the Gang, uh, all those type of things. Prince, obviously, after, to nice. Jay, Peony, to Travis, which I've been listening a lot lately, Travis Scott. Great guy, which by the way I met uh, two or three times now. Very cool. I mean, I, I, I met a true creative genius. So let's see where that brings us. Um, and, and then sometimes I can listen to uh, opera, okay, or Broadway, or Broadway shows. Fabulous. It depends. So let's talk about the 1159. When it was launched, uh, it was a watch that. I think, well, I think from the reaction on the internet was sort of mixed and a little bit controversial, but I think once- What you call mixed? You call that mixed? I call this, no, no, I don't call this mixed. I call this, we got hammered, okay, yeah. in the first two days, yeah. and after it started to shift, okay? But you know, the, this is also what, like, like social media can be a very positive thing, but it can also have a negative effect as well, which is sometimes when people want to be negative and they want to pile on, you know, and you see this a lot now with a lot of like the racism that's going on in America and, you know, like the Asian newscasters getting all these negative comments and so on like that. I mean, it's terrible, but when people want to be opportunistic, they can. So any, anyway, I don't want to get too political, but, but anyway, so couple, first couple of days, people uh, like hammered it. And then it started to kind of like regain its traction uh, and in the end finished with an incredible sale at only watch $1 million for the automatic skeletonized tourbillon, which was pretty badass. And then winning a whole bunch of awards at the Geneva Grand Prix as well. So did it make you feel like vindicated at that point or, you know, were you, were you happy? Look. No, listen, listen. Yes, we were happy. And it's not I was happy, it's we were happy because the thing that affected me the most at the beginning was that we had some of our watchmakers, the people who worked on the watch, that were really affected in a, in a, in a, in a, in a sad way. And I told them, listen, for, forget that. Because today, as good as a brand could be, when you launch something, you know that pretty much you're going to get 50, 60% of people saying, I love it, and 40% 40, 40 of people saying, I hate it. That's uh, where the social media works today. You never get a full 100% because people will always find a way to find a negative effect in something. And that's the world we are living in. Okay, so that's not the way we built the success of a, of, of, of a line. And I always say that if we have had social media in 1972, oh, yeah. the rhino would have been crushed, crushed. Okay, the way it came, the price, semi seal when everything was in precious metal, Come on, it would have been destroyed when the offshore came in 1993. Yeah. No social media then. But what do you think it would have happened? <laughs> we were even scared ourselves. Ourselves we are scared and concerned about it. So 
Code 1159 is here for a long run. We are building a collection. There was an unbelievable job done on the mechanisms as well. Yeah. Okay, to launch six new mechanisms, come on, it's, it's, it's completely unheard of. And we know already what we're launching for the next three years. There will be some really cool innovations, movement-wise, and colors of dials that I've been waiting for so long and that we can finally see. Some of them will be released in 2020. Uh, you know, I, I, I judge the quality and the emotion delivered by a watch if I really want to wear one. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't, I don't. If I could buy every other map here, I wouldn't buy them all. There are some which I don't like as much. But when I want something, in general, it's, it's good. And there are two Code 1159 coming out this year, which I'm going to wear in two seconds. In two seconds. So in, ge in general, that's a sort of a feel. That's awesome, dude. Okay, I, I really appreciate what you've done also um, related to your heritage, right? The creation of this new museum, all the work that you've been doing to uh, chronicle the, the history of complicated APs as well. The book that you guys published was incidentally awesome. And it was great because for the first time, you know, I mean, you know, there's information, but in one book, you can look back and realize that actually in many ways, AP has one of the most interesting, unique, and coolest histories with the perpetual calendar uh, of, of any brand, right? You know, and this is till modern day as well. This is in, includes 15, 2015 when you were already CEO and you introduced a new caliber, uh, the 5134, I think it was called. And, and, and then, then it also includes um, the launch of the ceramic perpetual calendar, which you was, was one of you, under your presidency. And then, and then, of course, the RD2, which is probably, you know, one of the biggest game changers out there. And that's also become one of your your most successful models also, you know? What is the power of the heritage department and what does it give to you for the future? I know we've seen the remaster, for example. It's our base. It's just our base. It's something you cannot go away from. And by the way, the book, it's, it's funny because it took a long time to put that book out. And we even thought about, should we do it? Should we, should we be that transparent about releasing basically every th single detail of every single complicated watch made? And actually, I've got a way of saying it, which is an absolute official legal inside trading <laughs> information. <laughs> Did you guys buy all the watches first? <laughs> I don't know, but it's legal, 150 million percent. Because guess what? People know now that, first of all, we didn't make that many watches. Yeah. We listed them all. So if you get the chance to put your hands on one, yeah. You want to talk about it? It's that Dude. Serious, that's and serious. just like, for example, the 1516s, man. Like, and there's it's, a and it's legal. Can you believe that? Legal. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but you know, listen, going back. Uh, but our, our historians have done this forever as well, right? I mean, yeah. whether it's paint daring or whatever, it, it's the same, you know, it's similar. But you know what? It's also a show of uh, that's our will to be more and more transparent with, with the public. Uh, the young generation will ask all the brands, again, not only the watch brands, but every single brand to make sure that what they say is true. And when they ask us to open the curtain, we want to be able to show exactly what was there. That's what matters. So transparency is going to be key for the years to come. And transparency can also be about saying that you made a mistake. It's okay. It's, who doesn't make mistakes? I mean, it's, it's, you can't look at it that way. And I'm a firm believer in transparency in that respect. But going back to the remaster, the good news is, yeah, the watch has been looked at and is great as a good look and everything. The sad news for me is it took us 20 years to see it coming because I had the discussion with Michael Friedman, right. okay? We used to work at Christie's in 2000 when we celebrated the 125th anniversary of the brand. We spoke about it one evening, okay, in New York City, in a bar, not getting drunk, but drinking a little bit. And we, we spoke about that project. And through the course of my life with AP, I brought that project so many, many times. And it's finally, it's finally there after 20 years. We've been a bit slow on that one. Amazing. Uh, but there will be, because the question came actually from Singapore, there will be a remaster too, obviously. They we're already uh, two, three, four, five in the pipeline. Is it based uh, on so you'll see. Is it based and on the that's a watch. Sorry. 
Is it based on the 5516, the famous perpetual calendar from 1955? I don't know what you're talking about. Anything <laughs> else you want to ask me, Pumpkin? <laughs> That's a cool <laughs> one. <office, definitely. laughs> yes, it is. You know, you know what the, the only thing that, was, that has created a challenge for me was, so with the success of all your modern perpetual calendar watches, like the uh, ceramic, like the, the, the ultra thin, and then with now this whole ability to look at all this information, I don't know if you're aware. Well, you're probably aware of it. The the, the 5554, which was the the perpetual calendar royal oak uh, from '83 up until uh, 2014, in two different generations of movements. Dude, like four years ago, they were like 30, 40 grand. Now they're like a freaking hundred grand. It's like they, they, it's and you know like and it doesn't matter which execution, steel, gold, whatever. Like, and I was looking at one like super seriously because I liked it when it didn't have the leap year indicator, which made it not necessarily the most practical, but it was just mm -hmm. a interesting watch. And I was like, should I? Shouldn't I? Then I went back to go look at the prices. They've gone insane. You know? Did you know this is what was going to have an effect on the residual values? No, because you you don't you never plan it that way. Because at the end, what I always say in business, the market is always right. The market decides, not the brand. We could do whatever we want. The brand cannot decide that the value is going to increase on watches from the 70s or 80s. The market's going to drive that completely. And if you do the right work between releasing new models while talking to and delivering emotions to clients, and then you share your history at the same time that nobody knew. Very few people knew what Audemars Piguet had in the pipeline for many, many years. And now they look at it and they look at the quantities of what she's made. Say, come on, guys, I want, I want them the originals. I want to go back to that. And when you start to have two, three, four, five, ten people, price go up. But a brand can never actually provoke that directly. The, the, I'm telling everyone right now, like your last chance right now is the 5548, right? Um, that's that kind of very beautiful round, kind of fairly small size, slim watch that was started in 78 and then it ran until I, I forgot when. But uh, that's, I think you can still get them for a pretty accessible price. But if yes. you don't get it now, it's going to be over, right? So, so now I've got to change my entire focus and look at this. Okay, so right. we especially, yeah. especially if they are in rose gold. Ah, nice. Writing this down. <laughs> Especially because platinum, you're gonna find here and there. Yellow yeah. gold, very easy. Yeah. Rose gold, ooh, yes. do, 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 do. and I also love the fact that because of you've got the museum and you've got Michael, you have a patrimony department. If people need to learn about their watch and to find out some information or get an extract or something like that, they have the possibility to approach the museum. This is one of the you know greatest things that any manufacturer can do. You know, one of the best experiences I, I've ever saw at the museum, the older museums before, there was a, one of our good Chinese clients that came and he had a watch from his dad. And when he came, actually, we opened the books where it was written by him. Wow. And he saw his dad's name in the book. That's cool. Because at that time, we could have sold watches directly to people as well. And he, and, and he saw his dad's name. And he started to cry. That's so crazy. that emotion cannot be faked. There is nothing the guy saw literally his dad's name on the book. And he started to cry. That's incredible. Um, okay, so last thing. Uh, Francois, you know, and when you talk about AP, you think about it as a family. Um, part of it is also because the majority of the guys who work for AP are your own guys, right? If you made the decision to move away from wholesale and switch more towards retail, which means that you now have a fairly large family you got to take care of during this period. You got a lot mm -hmm. of overhead, you got a lot of mouths to feed. Was this still the right decision despite what we're facing right now? And will it be more challenging to come out of this? Or do you think you guys are, are will be fine? I don't know, no, no. there is no going back. This was the best decision because more than ever, think about it that way. A lot of people who have been collecting watches will also see their lives affected with the COVID-19. One way or the other, through their businesses, through their, name it, it could be many, many things. And a lot of people that were buyers of watches could be sellers of watches for a month or years to come. Who knows? Who knows what's gonna happen? There is no way as a brand, we could actually miss the opportunity to know exactly what in people's mind with what we are going through. We need to be closer than ever 
to our clients. We, we, we don't have to be stalkers. We have to be butlers, but we have to be smart enough to foster a communication and an energy between people that shows that it's not about, oh, oh we are selling 40,000 watches. Mm, maybe we're going to lose 5,000 watches or 7,000 watches this year. Mm. Oh, the company is in trouble. The company is not in trouble and won't be in trouble. What matters the most is, okay, maybe Mr. Client, you're in a bad place right now. You don't want to buy anything anymore and for quite some time. That's okay. I still want to be able to interact with you one way or the other, providing that you want. If you want, I'm, I'm here. If I had somebody in between and not know exactly what's going on, I mean, at the price level we're selling our watches, that would be completely insane. And we want more than ever that direct communication with people. That's the only way you know exactly what's, what's going to happen. Amazing. So, no, there is no going back. And as I said at the beginning, we are now 2,000 people at Podemar Piguet. And the first decision that we've made, and it wasn't even a decision, it was just a common discussion with Jasmine Odoma especially, say nobody will be let go, no matter what. Wow. Bravo, my friend. That is incredible. Uh, so thank you very much, Francois. It's been, as always, a pleasure uh, talking to you, man. Uh, learned uh, a lot. One last thing, one last thing you need to do for me. Tell because me. for two things. One, why do you keep getting younger? Is that something that you, what do you take to keep <laughs> getting younger? For me, that's, you, you need to give me a little bit of that. That's one. But I want to know if, if you're still good with the, if you're still good with the AP move. So good? Okay. Yeah, of course. Okay, <laughs> I got to find it well. <laughs> All right, brother. Thank you so much. Okay, boys. Thank, Thank you. To seeing you in person, my brother. Thank you. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.